Welcome to Reading the Gospels Together for Monday, April the 27th, and we're reading Mark chapter 4 together. And when I say together, it's nice to know that our daily videos receive about 120 individual views. So you're participating in something together with many other people. I find that comforting in a time of isolation. The scriptures are written, they were written in communities of faith, four communities of faith, and they are meant to be read and heard and reflected upon in community. That makes what we're doing important. It's also another reason to do this together with a friend. I have lots of people tell me that they're doing this in conjunction with, uh, with others with whom they then have a phone call or email chat after watching the video or doing their reading together. If you haven't done that, give it a try. I think you'll find that it will increase your appreciation and understanding of the scriptures. But on to Mark chapter 4. It's a, uh, it's a parable chapter, and in introducing parables, uh, Mark tells us some, uh, some interesting things. First, he says, um, he, taught them, he taught them many things by parables. Now, the other Gospels also make this point. Jesus is famous for this type of teaching. We also hear at the conclusion of this section that uh, with many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. Now the Gospel of Mark is, uh, is never shy about saying when the disciples didn't have a clue about what Jesus was getting at and needed things explained. If there are times when you find the words of Jesus baffling, remember that you're in good company. The disciples did too. And these explanations are there for you. Now in today's first parable, this process is explained. First, the setting. There's a large crowd. It's so big that Jesus goes out from shore a small distance in a boat. And he uses the shoreline as a natural theater with the sound spreading out to the crowd clearly. Now notice I didn't say amphitheater. Ampha means two. An amphitheater is, is, is like this, with the speaker here and the, the crowd here. An amphitheater is two theaters put together, uh, making a round bowl like the, uh, like the Colosseum in Rome. Uh, that doesn't have anything to do with our story today. It's just a, just a bonus. Now, secondly, uh, we hear the parable itself. It's a simple story set in the imagery familiar to the listeners, to whom Jesus says, uh, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear, which is another way of saying, uh, everybody listen. But it also more importantly means everyone who wants to pay attention, now's the time to do so. Because Jesus goes on to say that there are many who have ears, but they don't bother to listen to Jesus' message, or they do so only to find fault or to criticize, and so miss the point and miss the blessing that's inherent in the parable. Now the disciples ask him to explain the parable, prompting the seemingly impatient response of Jesus, typical in Mark. Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? He then gives us a full explanation, giving us an insight into how parables work. We learn that the farmer planting seed on various kinds of soil is an analogy to how the word of God is received. Analogy means a word that stands beside another word for comparison's sake. Uh, the parable provides insight as to why some people wither in their faith. They don't stick with the program while others blossom. As the cultivation of soil improves in the parable, so does the strength of the crop. For some, their experience of faith is shallow and it's soon forgotten. This reminds you of people who come maybe for a special a service or an event, Christmas or Easter or a wedding, a baptism, a funeral. And they say to me how much they were impacted by the service. Often they were genuinely, sincerely moved and say to me, you know, I really have to start coming to church. But when the opportunity comes the following Sunday, uh, they've forgotten all about it. The second are those who enter into the life of faith with great enthusiasm until the going gets a bit rough. Trouble or persecution arises, says Jesus. Maybe their family is unsupportive of their newfound faith. They can't get everybody out the door on a Sunday morning. Or people are saying, I don't want to go. Or perhaps they've had a difficult encounter, unfortunately, with a fellow church member or minister, which has turned them off. Soon they disappear. 
The third are those who seem to be thriving. But, says Jesus, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in. Now, that seems most typical. There are so many other things that are more attractive or easier or flashier that tempt us away uh, from church. Uh, we're coming close into golf season. I wonder if they'll open those golf courses. I had a parishioner say to me as the good weather came one year, he said, see you in the fall when it's too cold to golf. I'll be worshiping God on the golf course every Sunday till then. But, but do you actually worship God on the golf course? I asked him. How much of your focus is actually on God during those 18 holes? Anyway, another sermon. Finally, in our parable, there's faith planted in good soil. But anyone who gardens knows that good soil takes work. Cultivation isn't automatic. Uh, like with farming, our faith takes an effort if we hope to grow in our faith. We prepare the soil through participation and worship. We, we feed and, and nourish the soil through reading and studying scripture and, and through prayer. We work the soil through our active service in the church and to other people in the community. When our faith is strong, it produces a harvest, meaning it impacts the lives of others and propagates the faith. The parable asks, how are we preparing our soil of faith? What kind of crop do we produce? Now in this parable, in this parable we see that we're to find ourselves within it and we're challenged to respond accordingly. The next three parables, the lamp on the stand, let your faith shine, the measure you use, be generous in sharing your faith, and the growing seed, do your part and God will do God's part, all follow on this main theme. With the parable of the mustard seed, a small seed which spreads to, to vast dimensions, Jesus is using the, the surroundings that are right there to illustrate his point. In the area where Jesus is giving this parable, the the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. I've often found myself walking with groups through vast, field of, uh, vast fields of wild yellow mustard. Now imagine Jesus holding up a tiny mustard seed and then gesturing to the fields of yellow, blanketing the fields. In the kingdom of God, big things come from small beginnings, says Jesus. Never underestimate the power of a small work of faith. Everything we do, big or small, contributes to God's kingdom. Now, Jesus calming the storm, which comes at the end of this chapter, really begins in the next chapter, and we'll deal with it tomorrow. And as you read chapter 5, see if you can figure out why I said the calming of the storm belongs in chapter 5, not in chapter 4. Look for the little details, and Jesus will really come alive for you. We'll see you then.